Hello and welcome to Audiobook Connection, behind the scenes with the creative teams. I'm Becky Parker Geist and I'm your host. Audiobook Connection is your place to learn about the audiobook creative process in discussions between the authors, narrators, producers, and post production teams that bring them all together, as well as guests who have listened to the audiobooks and have questions for the creative teams. This podcast is sponsored by Pro Audio Voices, helping great stories come alive through audiobook production and marketing. Hi, everyone. I'm so glad you're with us today. I'm really excited to have in the studio here with me Joshua Townsend. Joshua is someone who works with the creative process. He has a nature-based approach to the creative process and really is uh, working with people in any kind of story context. So I think we're going to have a lot of fun today as we talk about story and what that means in the creative process. So Joshua, thanks for being with me. Oh, pure pleasure being here. Thanks for the invite. Yeah. 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 So first of all, I want to give a big shout out to author and writing coach Laura Davis. Uh, Laura was the one who introduced us. And Laura and I co-narrated her memoir, The Burning Light of Two Stars, A Mother-Daughter Story, that is now available in your favorite audiobook locations. And you can find her at lauradavis.net. And Josh, I believe that you helped her with some vocal coaching on that as well. Is that right? We did a little bit of vocal coaching, more about working on reading the script aloud as opposed to vocal production itself. Right. Laura also has a background in radio, radio. So she wasn't coming in novice. But I, I will say, I will say that I was a huge advocate of her from the first moment she mentioned the audiobook yeah. that I was like, absolutely, you have to be involved in writing in the performance of it. I did work with Laura Davis for about a year and a half on the narrative getting the story down, getting the through line down. That's where we did the heavy lift together. Mm -hmm. And then when it came to her doing her own performance, I just shared with her a couple of sessions of how to break down a script, how to break it down. So I I know we're going to talk about this, but this whole thing of like hearing someone reading left to right just drives me crazy, Mm -hmm. you know, in, in a good way. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So we're going to dive down that rabbit hole. So, (laughs) no, when we first talked and it was uh, that was actually really exciting, you know, sort of riff on a lot of these ideas. But when we first met, we were talking about the telling of the story, the breathing life into the narrative. So that's the rabbit hole I would like to dive down first with you. And for our listeners, like, how would you describe that difference? the difference between an artistic approach and a technical approach to narration. So the actual performance of the words, is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Once the narrative is taken care of by the writer, by the author, then it's incumbent upon the uh, performer, the artist, the actor, the voiceover talent to breathe life into it, like like you had just right. said, in the sense of it has to come across as if for the very first time. As if this has never been said before and we, we meaning the the talent and the audience, get to go on this discovery path, discovery process together. To to me, that's the ideal. When I hear repetition, when I hear uh, here we go again, when I hear this this thing underneath it or there's no discovery or it's flat or there's no point of view, we can go through a lot of things of what's not there. But Right, yeah. Then it's like I might as well be reading it myself. Mm -hmm. Right. Because, and we're not in school anymore. You know what I mean? This is not oral interpretation. Right. This is, we're here to make discoveries and to bring something else to it than other than just the literary word. Yeah. Yeah. How do you feel about that? (laughs) Yeah. Well, I, I think that one of the places I most often hear that difference that you're talking about is especially like at the beginning of sentences, because it is almost like, have I just had this idea? Has this mm-hmm. this thought, this way of expressing these words, there's a kind of um, attack, if you will, from a technical standpoint of how that can come across. Because if you compare somebody that you're in conversation with, it sounds often very different from listening to sort of a typical narrative, right? And of course, 
depending on the material and what's happening in the story at the moment, you know, we're not always necessarily trying to make it sound like we're in the coffee shop across from, you know, the person that we're, we're telling this story to. We might be instead under the covers at bedtime and conveying the story in a whole different way. But there's still this element, this feeling of it's new, it's fresh. The idea, that spontaneity. I loved what you touched on there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Creating in the moment for the moment. See, everything is being performed live. Now, I might consume it, hear it, can, but everything. There is not a time where something is not performed live, (laughs) at least in that moment. And so we, we need to like really understand that and work with that. And like when I have a conversation with you in real time, as does anybody. Yes. We find the words right in real time, yeah, and it's created in the moment. And I'm thinking in thoughts; I'm not thinking in sentences, right, right. And that's the biggest difference. Yeah. And when I was in um, going through actor training a long time ago now, but one of the things that I feel like is the the core of the acting process for me is being in the thought process for mm-hmm. the the character. Like, mm-hmm. you know, we're given these words. And as mm-hmm. an actor, I feel like as I'm learning those words that I'm going to have to say that they're going to sound spontaneous because I want them to be, you know, I, I want to be experiencing them in that moment. Mm-hmm. But the I choose this word. I don't choose a slightly different word. Mm-hmm. And grasping, getting sort of wrapping the thought around why that word mm-hmm. helps me sort of live the thought stream which i think is mm-hmm. is kind of what you're talking about there it's mm-hmm. it's not mm-hmm. about the speaking of the words or the sentences it is about the expression of the thoughts yes and so it's tracking the inner life of the what i call tracking the inner life of the character nice. i have to be able to track the inner life of the character to know where they are what thoughts what feelings are they having yeah and when i do that <sighs> Like I can go, like I can go into a state of being right now where I'm like, I'm feeling slightly tight, slightly contracted Mm -hmm. and I'm a little confused and I'm like, I don't know what to say. So I'm not thinking, I don't know what to say. I have thoughts and feelings that produce that. I don't know what to say. Yeah. So if I'm really doing, if I'm doing service to a a narrative, I want to go into that thought and feeling and then allow the words to travel on top. Yeah, yeah. As opposed to, what was the line of dialogue I just said? I don't know what to say. I I don't know what to say. Right. How how is that for a line? (laughs) I don't know what to say. (laughs) Nay, my Lord, what ho? (laughs) You know? Yeah. And, you know, or or oration is what they used to call it, is is a whole nother world, you know? Yeah. What would you say for those who maybe haven't thought about the narrative in this way before? That, Hmm. you know, what is there a way that you can express that sort of recognition of what it's like, what that difference is, other than, you know, beyond what we've already said. And I don't know if there is, so that's fine if there's not. But that someone might recognize the difference between, or feel the difference between the Mm -hmm. reading of a story and maybe a, Mm -hmm. you know, a good reading of the story. But that Mm -hmm. difference between that and the light, it coming to life through them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the... The significant difference is that I am on the, I, the audience, am on the journey with the person and I'm not thinking ahead. Right. Or I'm not dropping out. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's why when people go to the movies or when they go into, go heavily into a book or they're going into an audio experience, they go beyond time. Yeah. Yeah. They were like, oh my God, that, that was an hour? Yeah. Because I'm going moment to moment in that experience with that person and the future and the past fall away. Yeah. That is, that's the ideal, right? Yeah. That's what we all want. Yeah. And that, you know, I've often, in, as I talk about 
the audiobook narrative process in many episodes, I, I often refer to the importance of engagement. And that is a piece of it for me, is that there are other ways that I also use that in terms of like staying engaged with an author. But the engagement within the telling of the story mm-hmm. is mm-hmm. is very much what you just described, where you get you're in it. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. And there's a lot of moving parts on that. So uh, I'm giving a result. The result is engagement, right? How do you get to engagement? Ah, well, hmm, there's the rub. So, you know, it's like when one does short form narrative, there are certain things that need to be in place in order for that to happen. When one does long form narrative, other things need to come into play. Much more complex. You want to go a little deeper on that? Sure, yeah. So I've noticed that somewhere between 11 and 17 minutes, plus or minus, depending upon the medium, right? Feature films has a slightly different thing than a narration, which is different than a a theater piece, etc. But somewhere in there, we as human beings unconsciously expect, demand, want something from a short piece. And we will leave that experience satisfied. As soon as you cross over that, let's just say 15 minutes for right now, 15 minute threshold, Mm -hmm. another part of us kicks in wanting another kind of experience. Mm -hmm. And that's more challenging because there's more moving parts. And I'll, I'll, I'll share with you how everyone has experienced this. It's when you go and watch um, a Saturday Night Live or something like that, right? yeah. and you see a three to five minute comedy sketch, and it's hysterical. Yeah. Then they take that same premise and turn it into a feature film, and it's flat. Right. Yes. Yeah. That's that's the difference. Yeah. Huh. Very interesting. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. So there's another um, piece I want to talk to you about, and that's sort of keeping genre in mind. Yeah. How much reality <sighs> do we want to bring to our performance when we're talking with authors? Uh, you know, we'll sometimes we'll ask them in the in the ca- early in the casting process, like, are you looking for something that's a little more like leaning into the theatricality of it or more subtle? Yeah. What do you think about this? Oh, I love that you said that just now. How much reality? Essentially, that's the question. You know, within the genre worlds, you already have a preset. Do you know what I mean? Like there's like within the, let's say the genre of romantic comedy, let's just say that. In the world of romantic comedy, you're not allowed to do 100% emotional realism. Right. It goes too deep. It's not. That's not what we're looking for. Yeah. Right. It's it's not a romantic. Mm -hmm. If you do that, it's no longer romantic comedy, Right. right? But it can't be as thin as a cartoon. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. So there's somewhere in there we generally accept like, okay, that's reality within the genre of romantic comedy. And in my opinion, my personal opinion, the the ones that, that crest that in 70, 80 percent uh, emotional reality depth yeah. and then have a couple of scenes where it does a nice turn, you know, mm-hmm. where you kind of go outside of romantic comedy, you get really real. Those to me are the most fulfilling for mm-hmm. me. And then, and then other ones are, are just light all the way through, and they're, they're probably traveling around 40, 50% re- emotional reality. Mm-hmm. But to identify that as a creative, as an author, as a producer, as a whoever, is critical for how your piece will turn out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And how, and how happy you will be. And, and how would you connect the pieces of when we were talking about the sort of the emotional reality of being in the story, those thought processes, the that aspect of it that we were talking about earlier and bringing that together into this piece of the conversation. Yeah, I love that follow-up. You're right on track because that is the tell and, and that is the challenge, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. So you're 100% on track with that. Ironically, it's exactly the same. In other words, the emotional commitment to the object, I don't want to get fancy here, emotional commitment to the object, how much, the, let's say it's a guy-girl romantic comedy, just to make it simple. Sure. Guy-girl romantic comedy, so he falls headle- headlessly, <laughs> head over heels in love with her. And his emotional commitment to that is the underbelly, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. So the it has to be real to him to some degree. Yeah. Then the expression of it 
is where the comedy comes in. Right. But the underbelly of it has to have that depth. If it doesn't have that depth and he just does the, the, the you know, the funny things of running into walls and, oh, oh right. you know, and, <laughs> the, you know, pretending to be the waiter to get close to her or all that other, you know, yeah. funny stuff that happens, yeah. then it'll be, become more like a cartoon. Right. Right. And that's where we have, like, if we were on stage, the mugging, you know, the sort of like, oh, I'm making this funny face to say this thing, you know, that that's the kind of thing that we often will see in that the false expression where it doesn't have that underbelly. We're just doing it on a technical level. Yes. And so, again, that get, that comes back to that thing about, you know, is your intention to be a technician? Is your intention to be an artist yeah. without having a, an emotional pull towards one or the other, just how, how are you hardwired? Yeah. Because everyone's different. And, and my opinion, or from my experience, is that people that are more technical, technically driven, eventually will turn the corner and go more artistic. And then people who are artistic eventually need to balance out by, by learning or having some technical ability under their belt. Yeah. So it, it's a very interesting process. Yeah, yeah. And just uh, sorry, going back... Again, to that, the the notion that the, you know, if the expression is broad, let's say like with, uh, if we're mugging on stage, that doesn't mm-hmm. necessarily mean that it can't right. have that that underbelly that you're talking about. Absolutely. It absolutely can. Mm-hmm. It's a different way. It's a different expression. But mm-hmm. the substance is still there. And I think regardless mm-hmm. of that level of i'll call it theatricality mm-hmm. for for simplicity mm-hmm. that level of of uh, theatricality is not determining whether or not there is the truth the undercurrent the spontaneity the nowness of the moment mm-hmm. it's a different piece of that puzzle mhm yes yeah. and it's really important to define that yeah. and and to know what land you're you're playing in yeah and I'm right now I'm thinking about children's stories just because that's what's coming in. But this thing of like, you know, there's there's people that read children's stories and then there's people that read children's stories. Right. Right. And that's also a good indicator of what we're talking about in terms of the difference. Yeah. Am I just putting on like oh, like okay, I, I I just love watching people. It's part of my joy in yeah. life, but I'll never forget, I, I saw this lady walk through an airport once and I could tell she was a professional, you know, like she worked there, you know, but she didn't have her costume on uh-huh. yet <laughs> and she was not in a good mood. And then like minutes later, she was in her costume and she was in her little airline outfit yeah. or whatever at the desk and the lady was dealing with irate passengers and I saw her persona. Yeah. Is there anything else I can help you with? <laughs> Would you like fries with your order? You know? <laughs> And but she was really good at it, mm-hmm. yeah. And that's the difference. Yeah. Hmm. All right, so. One of the things that we are fairly often asked about by authors, and it's a, a concern that that many authors have, uh, especially before they come to us and and start talking to us about this, but. Mm-hmm. It's the question of, so especially for those who are writing in the realms of memoir and and spiritual content, Mm -hmm. there's often Mm -hmm. this feeling that they have when they come to us that there's, they have to be the one to record it, even if they don't feel comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. Because the, the thinking is that no one else can express their content with the energy that they as the authors would, because it feels so very personal. And Mm -hmm. then we've also, you know, in working with many of those authors, we've also frequently amazed them that again and again at at how it's not only possible, but sometimes even better than they could have imagined it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because, (laughs) you know, there's it is this ability to tap into Mm -hmm. the reality of the content. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't mean you have to have personally lived it up to that point, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. You know, I was thinking about how I, I think that there is a, a kind of, of, there is a birthing of stories. And mm-hmm. then there is the release of each story, just like with kids, you know, that 
that when we let our kids grow up and expand and instead of trying to control every step that they take, every aspect of their lives, that that they're much more likely to thrive. Mm-hmm. And and I've I've come to consider the the stories themselves and the characters that are created within them, that are sort of born within those stories. Mm-hmm. As though they're like, well, those are thought beings. Okay, they may not have this they may not have flesh attached to them, but they are th- as as real in our thoughts as, uh, you know, our next door neighbors that we're not seeing right now, but we know they exist, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. They're very present in our lives. They're very, they have a lot of impact frequently in our lives. Mm-hmm. Best ones do. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And that their life continues to expand with each reader, with each listener. What do you think about the idea that only the author can best narrate their own work. What do you think about that? Yeah, you, you touched on so many topics in that. In that yeah, we'll play with any of those. Thing. <laughs> any one of <laughs> Take them. Take your pick. <laughs> the, the first thing that came up for me as, as you were sharing that was create, release, relax. And that's so important. You know, that's the natural process. That's the nature-based aspect of part of the work I do, which is you create something, you release it, you put it out into the world, or you share it with a friend or whatever it is, and then you relax. And then that relaxation is a reintegration process. And then you do it again, create, release, relax. And then there's short frames and long frames and everything else in between. In order to experience something, in order to express something, do I need to experience what it is on the page? Absolutely not. So, because if that were true, then anyone who plays a murderer in a, in a film would have to go off and murder someone. Right. And that's not going to happen. Right. <laughs> now, we've all murdered flies, right? Yep. So we have that sense of, you know, <laughs> rage or whatever, and then putting out someone, putting out a life. So, or even if you've never personally killed a fly, you've you've driven in a car that had mass, you know, carnage to like to, to like little mosquitoes, however right. you want to say it. Right. So it, that's not where my my interest lies. My interest lies is: Am I excited to hear the author's words say them? Yes, I, that's that's something that I personally think is like fantastic. Is it incumbent upon them? No, it's not. Do they have a passion for it? Then then let's see what they can do, right? Right, yeah. Then on the other side of that is this. How many Academy Awards session uh, broadcasts have you listened to and you hear the author saying, oh my God, I didn't know that character until so-and-so played them? How yes. Many, how many times have you heard that? Oh, so many times. So many times. How yeah. many times have you heard the actor say, oh my God, thanks to so-and-so for writing this because da-da-da-da-da. How many times have you heard that? Oh, yep. Just, yeah. <laughs> so it, it, it truly is a collab. If you are going to go you know, and cast someone to do it for you, there's a lot of upsides. First of all, you have another, another palette to play with. You have collaboration to play with. And the part that Depending upon, this is more character, person-driven than anything else. But if I live with something and I hear it in my head mm-hmm. and I only think of it being shared in that way, that can be one of the biggest disservices to your project. I agree. It makes me think about the fact that there are the occasions where an author may listen to, you know, they're like listening, they're trying to cast a pro. we're trying to cast a project, and they're so caught up with the way it sounds in their head that they're not able, they're not open to hearing the potential for where it could go with a different voice or with a voice that's going to bring it to life. I love the way you said that with a, another palette. Just we expand the potential with that other palette. Yeah. Yeah. And ultimately, you're hiring someone with a sense and sensibility that's in alignment with the project. Right. You know, because that's the artistic creative thing. And then you could also hire someone who's a technician who who's replicated that before. And now you're going to have him replicate it or her replicate mm-hmm. it again. Yeah. But ultimately, such a personal individual sort of choice. Mm-hmm. And then because of uh, technology, we have so many different areas where you could have someone else read it and then you can have the author do the preface or, or notes right. or mm-hmm. a, another way to get their voice in there. Right. But the ultimate question I would ask is, what choice is going to serve the project the most? Yes. Yeah. Beautiful. Let's take a short pause and we'll be right back. If your past vanished... Who might you become? 
Hannah, a 46-year-old author plagued with anxiety, and her partner, James, an HR recruiter caught in a headlock of grief over his brother's death, are as desperate for inner peace as they are clueless about how to find it. But when they embark on a sunny bike ride shortly after moving to the San Francisco Bay Area, a split-second decision propels them into different versions of their lives, ones they don't recognize as their own. With a mental fog obscuring their recent past and who they were, they are forced to dig inside themselves to figure out who they are now. Surprising discoveries about the nature of the universe send them on a psychological journey towards who they can be. But will they be able to let go of their deeply ingrained subconscious beliefs about life and themselves to embrace the unfamiliar potentials they now face? Get your copy of The Left Turn, Two Lives, Worlds Apart, book one in the Split Universe series at bit.ly slash geist hyphen su1. That's bit dot l-y slash g-e-i-s-t hyphen s-u the number one. And we're back. Let's talk about perfectionism. Ah, and, yeah. <laughs> partly because, you know, we've been talking about a kind of, I'll call it fine-tuning, although it's something much deeper than that. Fine-tuning sounds kind of technical rather than artistic. But I want to make sure that our, our listeners don't become obsessed with this idea of getting the recording to sound perfect through some kind of idea of perfectionism. So how would you say that the ism of perfectionism is, is kind of getting in the way of our creative flow? A hundred percent, all the time, every the, day. How's that? that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How's that? That was easy. <laughs> yeah, that's, I would say it's one of the biggest ones. It really is. And it's something that's really challenging because as an artist, as a creative, one of the reasons why it's there is because most of us are exposed to the creative arts in school. And in school, if you learn school and creativity, you're going to get graded. And because you're going to get graded, you want it to be perfect because you want the best grade, which then sucks all the life energy out of the creative process. Yeah. So that said, there's this famous opera singer named Luciani Pavarotti, and maybe I'm not saying it exactly correctly. But Sounded right. <laughs> yes, he, he's an amazing opera singer. I highly recommend everyone going and listening to him. At the height of his career, he stopped his career for two to three years and retrained his instrument, meaning his voice, and then came back and relaunched his career to even greater heights. Hardly ever do you ever even touch on that story. Right, right. So this idea that this tenor... Luciano Pavarotti could be perfect, stop, retrain himself and go for new heights, I feel like is one of the best things of saying there is no such thing as perfect. Yeah. And when you go into his work and other people's work of that caliber, they will all tell you the same thing, that in performance, they cannot wait for the accident to happen. Mm. Yeah. And the, and the reason why is because it's just like that thing with Leonard Cohen, you know, it, the crack, that's how the light gets yeah. in. Yeah, yeah. Because you've set out a pattern, and in that pattern that looks perfect, mm -hmm. which has the difference between a technician and an artist, is that when the pattern gets broken by the artist, they use it as an opportunity to go deeper. Right. Right. As opposed to the, the human being that contracts and goes, oh, that wasn't right. Right. Yeah. And, and this idea of perfect also suggests that there is a kind of, uh, it, it, it imposes a real limitation, an end point on something that doesn't need to have an end point, that doesn't have an end point unless you encapsulate it in that way, right? So by leaving yeah. it open to continuous growth, you allow it to become ever better. And, th and that's why I'm saying Luciano Pavarotti retrained his instrument yeah. because he knew that there was more for him to explore. Yeah. Even though everyone... If you look at those articles, the uh, the opera world was like on fire with with him, and like he's the best. There's no one better. Blah blah blah, you know. Yeah. And the other side of what I'm talking about is on, on a broader aspect is this thing of um, open system and closed systems. Mm. So nature is based on an open system. Right. A manufacturing plant, like building a car, is built on a closed system. 
And that's why we go back to the, are you a technician or are you an artist? And not to say that it's, it's good to have cars, right? Mm -hmm. We want cars. Well, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> maybe we, we maybe not quite as many as we have. <laughs> <laughs> we want transport devices there you go. <laughs> that get us from one place to another that, that have parts that need to be precision made. They need to be perfect in order to go to make them interchangeable. So they, But the problem with that is that those systems, those systems wear out because they're a closed system. You always have to change out the parts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When you live in an open system like nature... It's constantly going through create, release, relax. It's constantly having new discovery. It's constantly coming. There is no perfection. No one goes and watches a sunset and goes, you know, last night's sunset was so much better. <laughs> no, no, seriously. It was just like tonight. I don't know. It's kind of flat. I just wasn't feeling it. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, that's great. We don't say that because, because we're living in an open system with nature and we enjoy that beauty of that moment. Yeah. Although I will say that I can also see ways in which humans try to impose a closed system on an open system, like, let's say, for example, a competitive flower show, <laughs> right? I was like, <laughs> my flower is mm -hmm. somehow better than your flower. You know, it's, it's like this, mm -hmm. yeah, it's trying to own and then also to encapsulate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. We want blue ribbons and red ribbons and yeah. first place trophies and, and we'll create ways to create a, a structure where we can get that. Yeah. And then that helps with marketing. It has to do with marketing and a bunch of other stuff. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, we're, 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 we're funny people. That's, that's so funny. I love that you said that. <laughs> yeah. Let's talk a little bit about solo work versus mm -hmm. ensemble work. Mm -hmm. We have many different contexts in which that comes about, whether it's from the writing process, the performance of an audiobook, you know, stage, many other places. Of course, we're focused mostly here on the, the writing and audiobook in particular. Mm -hmm. What would you say are some of those different challenges that arise in those two different contexts? This is a really specific question. Before I go into that, I, want to, I just want to mention that audio has never been more important in the history of the world as of right now, with the ability to consume audio on demand anywhere on the planet. It's like seriously insane yeah. where, where we're going with this and how important it is to bring that consciousness to the work we do because sound affects more than anything how you think. Yes. And sound current, to get fancy, is very potent. Yep. It is vibration. It is vibration. And everything is everything reduces to vibration. So I just want to call that Great. out. Great. Thank you. How, how important the work you're doing is and forwarding people that may not have huge corporations behind them and still getting that word out. So vital. Yeah. So it's the difference between ensemble and, and solo. Certain skill sets are required for each one of those. And neither one of them is better or worse. It's just different. Yeah. So when I'm doing a solo thing, I have no one to bounce from. So I have to self-generate. And that engagement is very specific. Yeah. It doesn't take what I call give and, well, people call give and take, you know. So you have that flow. Whereas opposed to an ensemble, you really have to be able to give everything and then receive everything. Right. And to have responses and to be available for change. And there's a lot more moving parts. Right. So those are those. Are, what, what are you noticing? Like, because because like, for instance, you can do a conversation in studio when you're recording and it's just one performer at a time or you can do it in real time. Right. What, what, what's your noticings around that? Yeah. So because uh, we do a fair number of full cast projects and mm -hmm. we do them in a group you know, the scene work is is in group sessions. We're not in the same space, but we right. do that because it makes such a difference when we're playing off each other. It's also a whole lot more fun. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but we get a much better result because, you know, we can guess how a, a different character is going to say a line, but maybe they don't say it that way. So if we're doing it all like, I'm just going to imagine what the other person says and I'm going to say my lines as if they're going to say them the way they, they are happening in my head, eh, we're going to have so many disconnects. So doing it in groups together, yeah, makes that huge difference. And also then what, what came up for me is 
thinking about how essential to performance the listening process is. Like, I mean, you see it especially on stage because you get to watch performers who are not speaking at the time and they're either listening or obviously not listening. <laughs> <laughs> obviously not yeah. listening, yes. And mm-hmm. when they're obviously not listening, they're you they're detracting from what's going on on the stage. So I, I work with this a lot. Yeah. And I have a whole thing, a whole thing you can work with me on one day, which is called whole body listening. And you're like, well, wait a minute. This is just audio. Why do I have to listen with my whole body? Well, believe me, voice voice talent doesn't work just with their voice. Right. The, like the whole body is engaged. Yes. Listening is an integral part of talking, being present, being responsive, mm-hmm. which is what you were just were talking about in terms of the difference between solo and ensemble. Yeah. Solo, you don't have to have that skill set. You don't have to. It's better, yeah. but you don't have to have the skill set of listening. And ensemble, you better. Yeah. Like, like you have to, right? And the thing of it is, is that, and this is this is where I go with with the work. Where I go with the work is why limit yourself to developing your skills and talents only when you're in rehearsal or in a or in a creative session? Yeah. Why not grow in real life? Yeah. So my question to you is, or to, or to people that are hearing this, is how present is the other person that you're talking to over coffee? How much do they go away? Right. And how much do you go away? Yeah. <laughs> how present are you in your day-to-day life is only an extension of how present you can be when you're, when you're doing this kind of work. Yeah. It, it, it's not like a switch where you can turn it on and off. Right. That, like your ability, your bandwidth to listen is what it is. In fact, if anything, it actually gets narrower when you have the duress and the stress of performance. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's great. It just brings that whole mindfulness of our entire lives right into this conversation. I love that. Which goes back to the sense and sensibility of of the artist, of the creative, which is ultimately what you're developing and and people will pay you for. Yeah. 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 Also, you know, and I was thinking about when you said with solo performance, that listening quality is helpful, it's less critical, perhaps. But I'm all, then it made me think about when we're doing a, a dialogue, even as a solo narrator, mm-hmm. there is one character and then that listening quality of the other character, the more we can actually be present. So the interesting thing is we we switch quickly from the thought process of one character and then we sort of jump into the thought process of the other character so there's a kind of dual thing going on because we're playing more than one person right Mm -hmm. but i i'm thinking about moments where you know one character says something that maybe is uh surprising or shocking to the other character Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. if we jump in immediately with that next Mm -hmm. line Mm-hmm. That tells me that the character who's jumping in hasn't really listened to what the other one just said. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I mean, there's... I do. Yeah, because I we do. we have that moment like we were talking about earlier about how we're thinking of what we're going to say mm-hmm. until the other person has said what they're going to say. <laughs> we don't know what we're responding to. And that, you know, unless we're tuned out which is, right. you know, like right. when we're sitting over coffee and our mind is thinking about either what we're going to say next while the other person's talking or about any number of other things, you know, where we're tuned out. So, I mean, and maybe that is appropriate for the character in the moment, but probably more often not. I, you're just so much fun to have conversations with because you, your talking is very nuanced and very um, particular. Yeah. So when you have a single, a single performer playing both roles. I worked with Anne Randolph, who's a master at this, by the way. I've worked with many other single solo performers. Is that in the writing process of that, one has to do what I call drill downs, drilling down into the discovery of the scene or whatever is playing out within each character. Mm -hmm. Like you can't just play the lead role. You have to play the other role and then write it from the other role and make discoveries from the other role. Otherwise, you just become this little like bouncing board for the lead character to have their moment. That's not real. Right, right. We all see this in in feature films and sometimes, in, and a lot of times in TV actually too, where like the waiter or the waitress or whoever is sitting around waiting 
for the lead character to do what they need to do so that they can perform what they need to perform. Right. Yeah. And that's not life. Life is, hey, hey, hold on. I'm, I'm, I'm serving this at the other table. You know, give me a minute, right? Yeah. Yeah. And it's put in by the writer as well. So it's not just the performers. Yeah. What you just said reminded me of. So I just released my novel, The Left Turn, Two Lives, Worlds Apart. And it is written from from two point of views. So there's Hannah mm-hmm. and there's James. And I wrote the f- when I got, you know, many drafts along, many edits along, I should say. I mm-hmm. turned it over to some beta readers and got their feedback. And one of the things mm-hmm. I learned was that I had done what you just described in that I was really focused mostly on the Hannah point of view. Mm-hmm. And so some of the comments I got were was, hey, we don't know much about James. He's not very clear or, you know, we don't, we don't know enough about him. And it mm-hmm. gave me the opportunity to go back in and do quite a lot of rewriting, mm-hmm. f- considering it from more from his point of view so that I could, f- you know, flesh out that character. Yeah, so the, the word point of view is in our context, in our parlance, just to be clear, is how the character thinks and feels. It's both thinking and feeling, right. mm-hmm. both. Hopes and dreams, fears and secrets, insecurities, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what, what you're talking about is when the other side is not developed, the, the other character is just a foil yeah. for the other person to go through the sequences that they need to do in order to have the scene go a certain way. And I'm here to share that there is no scene. (laughs) And until you have a development for the other character, character, characters, that what being executed is an outline, Mm. then there's no chance for discoveries. Right. I love this. It's great. (laughs) Isn't that that interesting? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it is. So it's all about discoveries and being available to, to listen for the discovery and Oh, you brought up that thing that that I just love that you mentioned a second ago is that thing, which is when someone says something and they have an emotional reaction to it immediately, did they even listen to it, right? Essentially. And my thing is, is I don't know. Isn't that what people do in life? Sometimes. But yeah, so it's what you need to figure out in a moment, I think, is because it all depends on what else is it's going on in that person's mind. Are they truly listening? And <laughs> then have to figure out what they're going to say about that thing? Or are they really caught up in their own stuff and they're only sort of half listening and they are ready to react? Just exactly. give me a little airspace and I'm on it, you know? I don't know. It's all going to be exactly. moment by moment. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And and that's something that one has to carve as the writer and, you know, directors and other people that are involved in that process. But but that's the carving because in just like in life, people are reacting and they're not even like the other person hasn't even really finished what their thought. Yeah. Which can be just like life. Mm-hmm. And then but there's the, the other side, which is, well, no, that that's the actor coming in, mm-hmm. not the character. And to know that delineation. And it, this is the example that I like to give around this topic. In American, American films, American, we play the contraction. In Europe, in European films, art house films, they play the relationship. Mm-hmm. And in those two is the difference mm-hmm. in general. Yeah, very cool. Mm-hmm. So the sensibility comes in is like, okay, are you going to be playing the contraction? So I, just to get, I want to make it clear so people really know what we're talking about here, which is the contraction looks something like this. Honey, I have something to tell you. What is it? I had an affair. What? Yeah. And I don't care. Male, female, it doesn't make a difference to me. Care less. So that's playing the contraction. Honey, I have something to tell you. What is it? I had an affair. How long has this been going on? Really? That long? I had no idea. Wow, that really hurts. That's the relationship. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so, which story are you telling? And I'm not saying that both aren't possible because both are, you know, it's character driven. Right? Yeah. But that's that's who we are as a, that's how culturally we're represented as Americans. That's how they're culturally represented as Europeans. Or, yeah. Oh, you touched on something that we we hadn't yet, and so I just want to, uh, I we're going to have to 
we're going to have to stop at some point. Uh, as fun what? as I know, what? we'll just have to. Can we? Can we do part? Yeah, two? we can definitely oh, do part two. But uh, <laughs> we're going to have to wrap up part one soon. But yes, you mentioned the director, and we hadn't yes. actually talked about the director. But you earlier when we were talking about expanding, you know, having another palette, having another. Um, you know, expansion of choices to work with and, you know, colors that we can work with, with a, a full cast project that, you know, that's certainly something that we always in include is, you know, having a, a director as a part of that. Now, sometimes we also have directors in, you know, whether it's a solo narrator, or, you know, some other context. But I just wanted to so call that forward, you know, what you were, you, your mention of the having the director, because it does, there are times when even in the ensemble work, you know, that, that actors are reacting off of each other, but may have missed something in the context in that moment where they really need that, that other ear to go, oh, oh, hang on, there's something different going on here. Let's try it with this understanding. Hugely important, uh, very important to have a, a single vision. Yeah. And then to have that single vision communicated extremely well. Yeah. And at the same time, making sure that there's someone that's main job is to keep that single vision in alignment in both big picture and in small picture and the small choices, the big choices, because everything has a ripple effect. Yes. And you want to be able to tie it back in, especially long form narrative, short form narrative. You won't you won't come across this as much yeah. long form narrative critical. Yeah. And also that ripple effect is also happening from the the author to the narrator or narrators to the listener that we are, you know, that rippling effect out into the world and the impact that each story is is creating. Yeah, it's so important. And this aspect of what you just said, uh, I'm, I'm going to call layers, yeah. you know, to consciously building those layers. And you can't get one without the other. It's like, you know, you can't build a wall without having a foundation, as trite as that might yeah, be. But yeah. starting with the foundation and everything builds off of these other layers that are going to happen. You can't hang drapes, you know, until you put in the windows. Right, yeah. Well, uh, uh, we'll we'll have to schedule a uh, second time, uh, at least one more. I'm sure that there will be more than that because uh, this is absolutely delightful. Well, well I'm sure there's going to be tons of questions that are going to be coming in from your listeners, yeah. and maybe we can, you know, make sure and answer those because I really want to make a priority that the the things that are coming up in production for people. Yeah are being addressed because, you know, it's real easy to sit here and say, well, I'm an artist, not a technician. But at a certain point, you know, there's certain technical things that has to be hit. Right. Great. Well, uh, for our listeners, again, this is Joshua Townsend. You can learn more at his website, joshuatownsend.com. And I want to spell that for you. That's uh, Joshua. And then Townsend is T-O-W-N-S-H-E-N-D, townsend.com. Joshua, thank you so much for spending this time with me. This has been a blast. Pure delight. Thank you. Thanks for joining us for Audiobook Connection, behind the scenes with the creative teams. Please take a moment to subscribe at audiobookconnection.com. The podcast is sponsored by Pro Audio Voices, helping great stories come alive through audiobook production and marketing. Learn more at proaudiovoices.com. Again, thanks for being with us and please join us next week.